Um, a welcome to the final in our Development Studies Department um, seminar series for 2024. I'm very excited today. We have Alexandra Kentikelenis and Thomas Stubbs talking about their brilliant book, A Thousand Cuts, which will soon be in the SOAS library because I have ordered it. Um, and uh, I'm Naomi Hussain. I work in the Development Studies Department. Uh, Alexandra and Thomas are going to talk for about 35 minutes about this book. Um, before they do, I just want to briefly introduce them. They both have really very impressive CVs. So Alexandra is a social scientist interested in political economy, international affairs, global health and development. He is currently an associate professor of political economy and sociology at Bocconi University, which is in Milan. But he's also had research posts at Oxford, Cambridge and, for good measure, also Harvard. So that's quite impressive. <laughs> um, a Thousand Cuts, Social Protection, The Age of Austerity is his first book with Thomas Stubbs. And it was published last year by Oxford University Press. His work has been in all of the leading journals. And he also has written for um, all the research has been picked up by a lot of uh, media outlets, including the New York Times, Le Monde, El País, Reuters, the BBC. Oh, and I didn't notice this before. It formed the basis of parliamentary questions in the UK and the European Parliament. You'll have to talk to us a bit about that. Um, but Alexandris is also the vice president of Greece's National Centre for Social Solidarity, which is quite interesting. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know more about that. And Thomas is a, 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 a social scientist interested in polit international political economy, African politics, global health and development as well currently a reader in global political economy at Royal Holloway University of London and a research associate in political economy at the Centre for Business Research, Cambridge. Um, and Thomas's work focuses on the activities of the multilateral institutions like the IMF um, and has been funded by a range of different funders. Uh, this is your first book as well. Um, and your work has also appeared in many, many academic journals. And you also, I noticed the curator of IMF Monitor, which is very cool, which which tracks essentially what the IMF does, a data hub used by academics, civil society and policymakers. Do have a look. IMF Monitor, it's online and on the various socials. Is it? Yeah. So I am going to hand over to you for your 35, 40 minutes. Um, and then we'll have some questions. And um, afterwards, if people feel like it, they can join us for a drink in the bar. Thank you very much for coming. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you very much for having me. It's uh, it's a real uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, I was uh, I was telling Naomi before that when I was a PhD student, I used to come to sales quite a lot uh, because I think you have the coolest library in all of London. Uh, I had never, you know, come to the basement of the building, but uh, here we are, and I'm very, very happy uh, to be here, and thankful that uh, you're taking the time uh, from competing uh, interests, uh, including an exciting encampment just outside, uh, to join us to talk about uh, austerity uh, in the Global South. So, um, okay, as Naomi said, the book was published about uh, nine months ago now, and I'll give an overview of uh, what the book is about, but I'll also expand the discussion a little bit more with what has happened since, uh, because the book kind of finished during COVID. So in that sense, uh, COVID was um, being trapped at home, was uh, productive in, in the sense for, for finishing finishing this book. But I'll update some of the um, data for uh, in relation to what has happened since. Now, we started working on these issues uh, around 2010, uh, when we met. We, we Tom and I did our PhDs together. We met on Freshers Week uh, and kind of started uh, basically having a lot of discussions around what was happening in the world. Of course, 2010 was the immediate aftermath of the global financial crisis, or more accurately, the North Atlantic financial crisis. And uh, me being Greek myself, I was like, well, uh, I had studied development studies. That's kind of my uh, one of my core fields. And I was like, well, everything I learned from development studies, I see playing out in Southern Europe uh, yet again. So, so we started this research agenda that uh, I'm going to talk about. And there were various debates happening at the time that we started doing this research. You know, there was influential work by people like Alberto Alessina and Francesco Giavazzi on austerity. 
uh, kind of uh, pushing forward this idea of so-called expansionary austerity. So if you cut, then the economy grows. Uh, you know, one discredited theory. Then you know these two people here you might recognize. They're Kenneth uh, Rogoff and Carmen Reinhardt whom the Financial Times dubbed uh, the godparents of austerity, really prominent economists, both of them uh, at Harvard, both of them. Well, Rogoff was the chief economist of the IMF, Reinhardt until recently was the chief economist of the World Bank, and um, kind of pushing forward this uh, idea that fiscal, uh, that there needs to be a lot of so-called fiscal consolidation. So so kind of this was the camp that was uh, doubling down on austerity. And then you had people like Mark Blythe basically pointing to how austerity can be self-defeating and uh, economically as well as socially uh, devastating. Now, a lot of this debate happened uh, in relation to the global north. Right. The, the discussion was happening, uh, trying to influence decisions in the global north. And indeed, this camp was uh, very successful at um, influencing policies. So what we wanted to do is uh, kind of shift the attention back uh, to the global south, but also have a, a broader understanding of what austerity is. So not austerity simply as cuts, budget cuts, uh, but expand the definition of austerity to introduce, uh, to include what are known as so-called structural reforms. Now, what are structural reforms? Uh, to answer that, I'll go to this uh, super cool economist from 93. This is a picture I found from the early 90s, you know, with uh, with an open tie to to show how cool he is, Larry Larry Summers. Uh, who uh, back then was um, on leave from Harvard to be the chief economist at, at the World Bank. And, uh, you know, in, in, in one of his um, speeches at the time, he was asked to define structural adjustment, of course, structural adjustment being uh, the define, one of the defining terms of the 1980s and 90s. And he referred to it thus. Uh, structural adjustment is the four Asians, stabilization, privatization, deregulation, liberalization. This is the only set of laws in economics, and they work everywhere. Right. So, so we tried to, we expanded how we understand austerity in the context of this book to include these types of policies. So uh, stabilization, that's primarily the fiscal consolidation part, the fiscal uh, reigning in budgets. Privatization of state-owned enterprises and natural resources, deregulation of economic activity, and liberalization of trade and capital uh, capital flows. So you know you might have heard of this uh, paradigm as the um, Washington Consensus as well. It has many names, but uh, we we don't use the Washington Consensus terminology. But it's the same uh, kind of policies now. In uh, these policy debates, the IMF was there, very present to set the tone uh, of these debates. And it does so through its lending practices, which are quite peculiar in the sense that its lending comes with strings attached, which are known as conditions or conditionalities. And that's exactly what we wanted to capture uh, in, uh, in this book. And kind of over time, we see the IMF taking uh, a leading role in dealing with uh, different types uh, of crisis. Here you just see some pictures from the media. Here's 84 in like a front page of a newspaper, a Tunisian newspaper, uh, where Tunisia just had to uh, increase bread prices. Uh, 80s and 90s uh, were the era of so-called food riots. So uh, basically, you just see demonstrations around the increases in uh, the price of bread in 84. This is a really famous picture from 97, where then managing director of the IMF, Michel Camdessou, is sternly, sternly looking over Suharto, who is signing uh, the IMF agreement, which uh, turned out to be quite uh, disastrous uh, in economic terms. 
And, you know, in 2010, the IMF became much more actively engaged in Europe. And this is uh, a picture from Greece with, you know, a lot of police presence and riots and uh, demonstrations. So, so kind of we see this line crossing through all of these decades um, in response to a very similar package of policies. Now, if you look at the IMF today, it has a very different face, right? Here you see the, its former managing director, uh, Christine Lagarde. She's now, of course, the president of the European Central Bank, kind of having a much friendlier face, right? She's uh, in Douala in Cameroon, uh, in an orphanage, dancing with the orphans, uh, like uh, showing um, how cool the managing director of a big financial institution can be. But, you know, if you look uh, up above her uh, shoulder, you'll see a soldier with a machine gun, right, which uh, immediately uh, hints at uh, the fact that actually, you know, what this organization is doing might be quite controversial to, to require a heavy uh, security presence. And, and that's kind of where we wanted uh, to dig deeper. If we stick with the Cameroon example, uh, we looked at, okay, what is Cameroon's relationship, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, with uh, the IMF? And we see if we look at the first two decades of the 21st century, we see that Cameroon is one of the top 10 countries implementing IMF programs. It has had to implement more than 600 conditions, so 600 individual policy reforms over uh, over a couple of decades. And uh, kind of it points to uh, to the very active role that the IMF continues to play in uh, in countries uh, in the global south. So that's exactly what we wanted to unpack in this book. And of course, there are these consistent uh, and persistent debates around kind of structural adjustment. Uh, you know, this is actually an, uh, a cartoon from uh, the early '90s. You know, what's the difference, 10 years of structural adjustment policies. But very often these debates centered around uh, the economic impacts of uh, IMF mandated policies. These policies are inextricably linked with what are known as lost decades for development, lost decades for development in Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as in, uh, in Latin America. And, and there is a, a really large literature on the economic implications uh, of IMF uh, programs. But uh, basically, we have kind of um, this narrative coming out of the institution, including this is 10 years ago now, of, well, we have changed. We don't do that anymore. So Christine Lagarde was explicitly asked, you know, what about structural adjustment programs in the early 2010s? And she was like, well, I don't really know what that is. We don't do it anymore. Uh, uh, it was before my time. And kind of uh, call us um, suspicious, but we were like, well, no, I think uh, from my end, I don't think any organization should be taken at face value in uh, terms of what they say. So we thought, OK, as social scientists, what we can do is go and collect data and figure out, well, is this true? It might be. Uh, and this kind of led to this research agenda that I'm presenting now. In particular, what we wanted to do was to um, return to a very uh, long-standing controversy around the social implications uh, of um, of structural adjustment policies, of austerity policies. This was a super influential report from the mid '80s uh, by UNICEF written by Francis Stewart, Richard Jolly, and uh, Giovanni Cornia, um, that called for adjustment with a human face. Basically, it was one of the early reports, the earliest reports pointing to the devastating social consequences of this policy paradigm. You know, later, Isabel Ortiz and colleagues, who was at UNICEF, uh, updated it. This uh, the second report is from 2011 or 2012, if I recall. So, so we wanted to link back uh, to these debates and, of course, uh, link them 
to uh, distributional considerations, right? So who is affected the most and how? Of course, the angle here originally was around children. Of course, women are disproportionately affected uh, by, these, uh, by these policies, and they have been around the world and over time for many reasons. Women are more likely to work in uh, the informal sector, and they're therefore disproportionately affected by economic downturns. Um, at the same time, austerity leads to decreases in the availability of social support measures, health services, and so on, which, uh, which um, of course, uh, has follow-on implications um, for women's ability to cope with uh, decreased uh, incomes. And of course, it shifts uh, the, the budget cuts shift a lot of care labor uh, to uh, to women uh, who carry um, a disproportionate um, uh, a disproportionate share of um, uh, of care work so and and we saw that time and time again I mean in Tanzania basically what you had a uh, study that's not ours but uh, you had deep deep cuts in health services uh an immediate medical brain drain. So uh, health sector workers leaving the country, uh, health services collapsing, and then all of the care work that was um, required was uh, undertaken disproportionately by women. So anyway, these debates uh, were going on for a long time and they were not settled and they were not settled for three key reasons. The one uh, is related to data. There was no data through which to uh, differentiate different types uh, of IMF programs, different types of policy packages. It was uh, fashionable um, a while ago to say, well, you know, the IMF and the World Bank for that matter, uh, promote these one size fits all policy packages, uh, which is not quite true. Uh, and it's actually not true in a way that is uh, empirically uh, interesting to unpack. You know, who gets what conditions, when and what what consequences do these conditions have? Um, the other was methodological. So we needed kind of uh, econometric innovations, which I'm not going to go uh, in a great length. Uh, the book has a whole chapter on, on econometrics, but we can talk about it in the Q&A. And the third one was kind of for organizational innovation at the IMF. The IMF, as well as these international financial institutions, are very good at uh, renaming uh, what they do all the time to basically keep people uh, like us, so observers, uh, social scientists, as well as civil society, constantly wondering, OK, what's new and what's old? So it's uh, structural adjustment programs were renamed uh in the much in, in kind of a much more positive uh frame as uh poverty reduction and growth programs uh which uh, then got a bad rep because uh there was no poverty or very little poverty reduction and very little growth and uh and then were renamed um uh, as extended credit facilities, which if you don't, it you know, it doesn't evoke anything. I think it's intended to sound boring. So uh, anyway, so so we're like, okay, let's go and collect all of this data. So we went to DC. Uh, we collected uh, loan agreements. Uh, so all loan agreements uh, over forty years, uh, from nineteen eighty until twenty nineteen. So we collected uh, these agreements, we uh, scanned them to extract individual conditions, so individual policy, policy reforms uh, from each of those uh, loan agreements. Overall, we end up with uh, a corpus of uh, conditions that is nearly 66,000 individual conditions applied to uh, 132 countries. Basically, it's uh, almost uh, every uh, loan middle income country has had at least one uh, IMF loan at some point in our in our data set. We classified conditions into mutually exclusive policy areas uh, and and kind of we we end up with this map that shows the prevalence of IMF reforms around the world. So you see that uh, basically, uh, throughout the 40 years that we study, 
uh, countries that have had to implement more than a thousand conditions are primarily in West Africa, Pakistan, Kyrgyzstan, Romania stand out. Um, you know, China uh, has uh, only had a very short IMF program in the early 80s. Of course, Russia had more uh, during its uh, transition uh, after the collapse of uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, Argentina is is um, uh, uh, a repeat uh, borrower from the IMF. So, so basically, we see that countries have had different cumulative expo exposures to uh, to such programs, uh, and um, so so this kind of shows what it looks like across the world if we differentiate uh, by conditions. So unsurprisingly, we see a lot of conditions on fiscal policy, on external debt issues, on the financial sector, on the external sector. Those are, quote unquote, the core areas of what the IMF does. And then we have all of these kind of newer non-core areas like privatizing state-owned enterprises, labor issues. Um, so usually uh, mandated reductions to the public sector wage uh, bill or liberalizing employment relations and so on. We have a lot of institutional reforms. This is about, um, you know, changing judicial practices, reforming ministries and so on, as well as this category of poverty reduction policies, which uh, I'll talk a bit uh, more about uh, later. And we see that you know these non-core areas were not there in the beginning uh, of the 80s, but we see this uh, so-called mission creep, what many organizational sociologists term as mission creep, uh, where from kind of the 90s onwards, uh, we see a lot of state-owned enterprise reform. Unsurprisingly, this peaks in the mid 90s. Why? Because that's kind of where Eastern Europe uh, starts going to the IMF um, and and they have to fundamentally reshape their political economies. We see labor issues um, showing up uh, quite a lot, institutional reforms, poverty reduction policies as well, but I'll talk about what these are in a moment. And of course, you know, you could say this and say, well, you know, these uh, state-owned enterprise uh, privatizations peaked in the mid-90s and the early 2000s. Uh, of course, with uh, privatizations, uh, notoriously, you know, countries can only privatize things once. Did you say the SOE reforms were? Uh, SOE reforms usually were privatizations of state-owned enterprises oh. or fundamental oh. governance oh. reforms. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much. You're welcome. So, you know, notoriously, you can only privatize something once. And, and, you know, we have countless examples from around the world of countries trying to reverse privatizations and, and failing for different reasons that we can get to later. So, so our analytical task uh, in the book is to try and link these IMF mandated conditions to social policies and outcomes. We primarily use quantitative uh, analysis. Uh, and econometric strategies that I'm, I'm not going to go uh, in depth. Um, but we can we can definitely talk about it in the Q and A. And what I want to do now is I'll give you like a brief overview of what the findings in the book are, and then I'll update these findings in line in light of what has been happening in the last uh, two three years. So uh, the question we're asking is, well, is the treatment worse than the disease, right? So so the IMF uh, likes to pretend uh, it's uh, a doctor. So it uses these medical analogies where, you know, the argument is that, well, you have a patient, which is a country in economic crisis, and you have the doctor who is the IMF, who, you know, has all of the training and expertise to deal with uh, whatever uh, illness uh, a country has. And of course, the doctor might prescribe uh, quite um, well therapies that can have adverse side effects or can be painful in some instances. But this is for the greater good because then the country will be healthy and, and happy and not need the doctor anymore. And what we're asking, well, is the doctor, is the treatment uh, in some cases worse uh, than the disease? And, and we do so by looking at different indicators. We looked at inequality. So basically what this shows you is that 
a heavier IMF programs. So IMF programs with more conditions uh, are associated with increases in income uh, inequality. If we look at the effects of uh, IMF mandated fiscal consolidation on the different income deciles, we basically see that the poor are the ones who lose out, the, the rich are the ones who win, and basically for those in decile seven, eight, and nine, uh, like the middle classes, so to speak, um, you know, we don't find statistically significant effects, right? So uh, it, it supports a lot of the criticism, uh, recurrent criticism by civil society on kind of how the poor uh, and the working classes are the ones who, uh, who are adversely affected, whereas the rich, of course, also having uh, been able to shift their capital abroad, uh, partly through uh, the opportunities that IMF programs open to them through capital account liberalization, uh, are able to uh, to do a lot, um, uh, to be a lot better off uh, than they were. That's actually part of the story, say, of Argentina, where the rich uh, basically sent all of their money abroad and it um, it exists, you know, in real estate investments in uh, Florida and so on. Anyway, so uh, shifting gears, health systems, basically we see similar dynamics. The heavier the IMF uh, program, the, the more adverse effects on government health spending as a share of GDP. Uh, we also looked at uh, mechanisms qualitatively, so reading the archival documents, and we saw kind of a lot of evidence that uh, there is limited fiscal space for investing in health. Uh, there are these wage and personnel uh, gaps linked to the medical brain drain that I, I discussed earlier. Uh, there are problems with executing uh, the budget for the health system. Uh, we found quotes around these specific issues like Guinea in 2014, you know, uh, the Minister of Finance wrote to the IMF and said, well, you know, because um, of the reduction in spending uh, and domestic investment, we couldn't really meet our targets when it came to priority spending, health and education spending. Um, of course, 2014 being relevant here because that's just before the Ebola crisis hit. So, so you know, just a year uh, before uh, a major, a major epidemic, uh, you had the finance minister ringing an alarm bell uh, for what the cuts to social services uh, were doing. We also looked at, uh, at different types of health outcomes. And again, we found uh, statistically significant effects. Uh, again, a similar logic here, more IMF conditions are associated with worse health outcomes or health system outcomes. We see effects, uh, negative effects, statistically significant at the uh, 0.05 level uh, of maternal mortal on maternal mortality, under five mortality, uh, health worker density, and so on. Uh, we find positive effects on smoking, so less people smoke in uh, the aftermath of IMF programs, which is a good um, reality check, right? Because what the one the key policy that the IMF uh, promote, promotes is increasing taxes, especially value-added taxes, very often on alcohol and tobacco. So the fact that we find statistically significant effects on the decreasing smoking prevalence is good in the sense that it resonates with the expectations that we had. Of course, these uh, positive effects are far outweighed by by the negative uh, consequences, but uh, it's there. It's there in the findings that we have. Um, and then, you know, I briefly mentioned social spending floors before. These are the attempts of the IMF to uh, to show this uh, human face. So it started introducing these um, conditions that mandate a minimum level of uh, social spending uh, within countries. To make uh, a long story short, uh, I mean, there is diverging implementation according to country income groups, but basically we collected data on all of them and only about 57% of them are met. 
right? So, so very often these conditions go unmet. And, and this is a, a, an issue to which I'll uh, return uh, in a moment. So this is kind of a, a, a quick summary of what you will find in the book. But of course, um, you know, a lot has changed since 2019, not least a pandemic that, uh, that changed the world of uh, global economic governance and international and financial institutions. You had the IMF uh, re-emerging as the, the global uh, firefighter, massive expansion in its, uh, in its lending capacity. It notoriously has a $1 trillion uh, lending firepower as well as uh, additional funds. Um, countries approved uh, additional so-called special drawing rights, which is a unit of account that uh, the IMF uses, which in turn allows it to uh, lend more to countries in need. So we wanted to see, well, where do we stand on all of these things since uh, in the aftermath um, of uh, the COVID crisis, in part because we're seeing uh, initial evidence that uh, we're having a return to austerity, right? So uh, what you'll see in this map is a figure we created. So what we did is we took public expenditures of the 2010s for each country and averaged it, right? So we wanted the 2010s to keep out any increase in public spending that happened due to COVID, right? So, so let's just see on average how much each country spent uh, in the tens. And then compare it to where its public spending is projected to be projected by the IMF in 2024, this year. So this is using the latest available data. And, and where you see red is you see that uh, what we term aggressive austerity. So in 2024, that country is going to spend one more than 1% less than what it did in the 2010s. You know, the orange are moderate contraction, so between zero and 1% less. And green is uh, expectations for increases in, um, in public spending. So, so basically what you see is that... Uh, you know, there's no clear overall pattern. Of course, Latin America stands out. Major countries are expected to see uh, budgetary contractions. Many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia as well, parts of uh, the Middle East. So we saw evidence of uh, a return to austerity, as well as uh, that being inextricably linked to uh, debt service and changes in debt service. Uh, which are particularly pronounced uh, for some countries. Again, what this figure shows is the average of the 2010s versus uh, where it's expected to be in 24. And you see massive increases in the cost of debt service, especially for lower middle and low, uh, low income uh, countries. For upper middle income, it's a bit less pronounced, even though uh, we see increases. But, you know, for lower middle, you see it was under 2% and now it's slightly under 4%. So, so we're talking about major, major uh, transformations when it comes to fiscal policy, which of course can take away much needed resources from social policies, right? Um, sadly, unlike uh, financial indicators, uh, indicators on spending for social protection uh, la are, you know, are published with usually a couple of years of lag. Uh, but even so, if we look at uh, the latest available data that we could get, so we looked at the relationship or the um, comparatively at how much money different countries spent on health versus debt service. And you see that over the 2010s, health was more than debt service even though debt service was increasing. Of course, uh, health spending kind of peaked in 2020 and 21, which is hardly surprising. Um, we don't have data on health spending beyond 21, but uh, I'm fairly certain that by now, debt service uh, spending um, 
has outpaced uh, health spending. So, so we see this ongoing uh, fiscal crisis, which kind of led us to ask, well, do we see this new cuddly IMF in line with the PR department uh, of the institution, uh, which really has introduced all of these new strategies? a social expenditure strategy in 2019, a climate strategy in 2021, uh, a so-called gender mainstreaming strategy in 2022. So, you know, is it true that all of this has had such a fundamental impact on what uh, the organization uh, has been doing? And, uh, and what I'll do now is uh, just provide you some information on each of those, and then, then I'll wrap up. But, uh, you know, we talked about social spending floors, so this attempt of the IMF to help countries uh, retain a minimum of spending. So we looked at all uh, IMF programs of uh, 2020 and 2021 uh, and 22, so, so those years. And, uh, and basically, we tried to look at, well, these social spending floors, what percentage of current spending do they account for? And basically, we see these massive differences, right? In uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, what social spending floors measure is purely one cash transfer program. In Cameroon, it's everything in the kitchen sink. It's like health, education, pensions, water and sanitation, uh, agriculture, and even some infrastructures, right? And, and you have countries in the middle. So, so basically they're not comparable. Uh, some for, for some countries, these include wage spending, in other countries, uh, public sector wage spending, in other countries they don't. So, so basically what this tells us is that um, these targets are quite varied and they can, easily be manipulated, whether by governments or by the IMF, to um, to be met or not met. Uh, so, you know, the, the definitions can change over time. Even so, what we would expect to see if they lived up to their promise was that they would increase over time, right? A floor, that's the idea. It's the minimum you can spend. And then ideally, it should increase from one year to the next. So, so we compared the target for the first program year to the second program year and, uh, and then adjusted for inflation. And basically, what you see is that in many countries, even in Congo, that was, had kind of the most limited social spending floor, we see major decreases in real terms from one year to the next. And, you know, in, uh, what is it, Niger, uh, Uganda, and Afghanistan, uh, we see some kind of more aspirational kind of increases that more are more uh, meaningful, potentially. Afghanistan is obviously not a good case because um, the program was discontinued the moment the Taliban uh, came to power. Uh, but, you know, we see a lot of red, right? A lot of major reductions uh, in... Uh, in ambition. On climate, uh, some of you may know uh, there is a new lending facility that the IMF has. It's so, the so-called uh, Resilience and Sustainability Facility. It's a new lending instrument. It's actually the first um, multilateral lending instrument that explicitly targets climate and it's new money. Um, so not like the World Bank has repurposed some money. The resilience and sustainability facility is exclusively using new money that states provided. Um, we can get into this at the q and I think it's actually quite a, a promising development and much more promising than alternative uh, climate financing arrangements that we have at the moment, like the so-called uh, just energy transition partnerships, which are signed usually at a um, bilateral or minilateral basis with uh, countries. And we collected all of the conditions attached to those loans. Basically, almost everything had to do with uh, fiscal policies, some sectoral policies. This is a diverse, uh, diverse group. Uh, the green is social protection policies they're in or some renewable policies. Now, I think this is a really good development. A lot of these policies are, in my view, or in our view, because we've done this together, unequivocally positive, right? It's trying to reform uh, how climate risks are embedded 
in public financial management and public investment management, how climate risks are supposed to be integrated in, uh, in stress tests for the financial sector and so on. Really positive developments. At the same time, you know, the bad part of uh, this is that uh, even this innovation reflects a very limiting understand limited and limiting understanding of uh, of climate policy. It's primarily a market based approach to dealing with climate issues. Carbon pricing being the the major major policy uh, promoted. Um, you know, here you see this category on taxes and subsidies. Basically, that is almost exclusively removal of energy subsidies, which um, in the IMF's uh, book is really positive. It's killing two birds with one stone. Why? Because you remove the energy subsidies, so you improve your fiscal balance. The government is spending less. And at the same time, you're doing something good for the environment because consumers are exposed to the true price of carbon uh, instead of having it subsidized by their government. Of course, you know this is limiting in a, uh, in a low resource setting because for many low and middle income countries, energy subsidies are really de facto the only social policy that has really wide reach. The energy expenditure of lower income households is um, is a very uh, represents a very high share of their total expenditure. Uh, so basically, removing energy subsidies. Um, you know, Naomi works on this, so so knows uh, knows this much better uh, than than we do, but. Um, immediately has negative social repercussions. And we've seen that in the form of uh, protests and riots around the world, uh, Sri Lanka, Zambia, Ecuador, uh, and elsewhere. So, so that's kind of it's uh, the IMS approach, a very mixed message approach. And then, you know, we had the so-called gender mainstreaming strategy. Uh, so what we did was, again, we took uh, all of the recent IMF agreements, and we did a really simple thing, which is did a word search for gender or women to see, well, is it mentioned? And in what context is it mentioned? So basically we see that in almost all cases, it is never mentioned at all. And where it says very limited, it's like the odd reference to female labor force participation. And that's that's the only, the only reference there. Uh, you know, more promisingly, Costa Rica, Costa Rica stands out. Of course, Costa Rica is a somewhat richer country, but they're innovating with gender budgeting uh, policies. But, you know, for the most part, um, there is uh, no gender and no mainstreaming in, uh, in, the, uh, in the recent uh, IMF programs. So all of this matters, and this is uh, kind of the, the, last, uh, the last slide. Uh, or our argument is that all of this matters because you know it directly relates. Even though our book kind of covers up until uh, the early years of the COVID, the of the COVID pandemic, uh, the early couple of years, uh, you know, this discussion and narrative around structural adjustment and how necessary it is is coming back, right? And we see evidence of that even in the ongoing policies of the IMF as well as the World Bank, uh, which has its IMF-like lending programs. They're called development policy loans. You know, we can talk about them separately, but we see this policy paradigm uh, kind of uh, remaining undead despite uh, a cumulative burden of evidence uh, that it neither delivers economically nor socially. Right. And uh, and our uh, and, and the evidence that we have tried to provide in this book uh, goes to to that point. And I leave it at that. And thank you very much for your attention. Well, why don't you come to the front and we'll have a, a, a good discussion now. Now, that was that was very, very nicely, tightly, brilliantly presented. Um, I'm just going to, Mike, who's going to, who's going to get, if there's uh, questions in the Q&A, will you be able to relay them? Or will I be able to see them somewhere here? You'll be able to see them. Yeah. Um, absolutely fabulous stuff. Um, 
I mean, obviously not fabulous stuff at all. Mm. It's absolutely horrendous. But the undead nature of this, of these, these zombie theories of austerity, fascinating, fascinating. And I was, when you were talking, I was remembering spending a whole afternoon with the guy in the IMF who's in charge of the, the fiscal unit. Mm -hmm. Basically, that you know this guy, right? I don't think we should name him, but you know this person. And um, he was telling me about his background when he used to be squatting in Brixton. And, you know, in his mind, he's a real progressive lefty. And and yet this, these are the kinds of policies that the organization comes up with. It's an incredibly powerful beast, isn't it? And, and the, you know, the, the Larry Summers quote, I think, was so powerful. You know, there's a really powerful, I know you did lots of econometrics and quantitative work, but there's a really powerful sociology to this to this um, whole intellectual, well, it's not an intellectual discourse, policy discourse, I think that's fascinating. Anyway, I, I have lots of questions, but I'm actually going to open up first um, and see who has anything to say, a comment, a question. Unless, Thomas, do you, did you want to add anything right now or do you want to? Uh, I have nothing now. I'm happy to respond to questions. Yeah. Great. So who would like to go first? Yes. And you can you can uh, tell us your name. My and... name is Paul Hudson. My name is Paul Hudson. Um, I'd like to thank you for a most interesting talk. And if I may say so, extremely well presented. Yeah. I only wish my Greek were four to percent as good as your English as well. <laughs> um, one of the things that struck me is repeatedly going through your talk is that you wonder whether the IMF learns anything. Mm -hmm. um, when Guy Standing was working with the International Le um, Labour Organization, he and a number of his colleagues um, did a uh, report, it must be going back at least 15 years ago, he gave a talk on it, of uh, 51 countries that had been in receipt of uh, aid from the World Bank and I think the the minimum sample is they had to be receiving aid for at least 10 years in advice. And what was very striking is that the conclusion of the study is that um, just 14 of those 51 countries, over this is an unweighted average, unweighted by population, this is an average of 14 countries, they increased their GDP by just over 2%. And the remaining 37, and I suppose this explains why the Americans tried unsuccessfully to su suppress the report. For the remaining 37, again, not weighted by population, there was a decrease of about 7% per annum in GDP. And I say this makes me very worried about the sort of people who are running the IMF. But your talk seems to just uh, reinforce all that. Thank you. Uh, any others? We'll take a couple before we uh, before we get responses. Yeah. Does anyone else? There's one at the back there. Thank you. And I have while you're while you're taking the mic round, I have one. Which is why well, I have several, but this one I really uh, I'm interested to know how. So in this in these current debates about the debt crisis, or I don't we don't not using the language of crisis in this current debt scenario, but this current debt scenario, low income countries facing a lot of debt, having a lot of debt in the post COVID period. How has your work been picked up by advocacy groups, activists? Um, to what extent? you know to, to what extent is it having an impact or is it just the imf saying yeah yeah we know yeah you know this is not news anyway yeah was it want to um yeah this is um uh karen choban from lecture in public policy management at um SOAS, uh, finance and management department so i was about to also um so it's your um your, um i mean that's um uh, external debt service to gdp ratio uh, seems to be a bit like say like probably driven by the the hike in global interest rates perhaps mm -hmm. and especially as like following up on the post covid so um yeah covid period fiscal expansion borrowing and then we are all like the, <clears throat> sorry uh, caught up with the uh, hike in global interest rates 
And then we see these like a series of uh, debt restructuring or like additional like IMF programs in Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Ghana, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so um, probably, again, yeah, it's like, like IMF policy, like legacies, then um, so how do you see this interaction between global rates plus IMF programs and this uh, vicious circle, this Sisyphus sort of this, uh, not being able to develop mm -hmm. because of these external shocks plus probably domestic uh, political economic uh, dynamics as well. Yeah. That's a great question. Do you want to take those first and then we'll come back for a second one? Do you want to start to yeah, yeah. Well, shall I give it a fair I'll, I'll take sure. your one and, and your question then feel free to kind of you know, that. <laughs> so, uh thanks Paul uh for your question. Um you, you introduced something quite interesting which was why isn't the IMF learning, right? Um and this I think was a similar question was asked by a scholar actually here, Hajun Chang, who who had a book called Bad Samaritans, who said, you know, uh the IMF and various organizations, are they bad people or do they have bad policies? Right. And obviously his answer is that they're bad policies. And so the question is, why aren't they learning? Um and I think there's a couple of things here. And the first is the people who make up the IMF, right? So this is a very narrow group of economists, uh, neoclassical economists from very few elite universities. And they've been socialized into a particular way of thinking. Um, and they've not been so exposed to heterodox economics or even to sociology or in, you know these other disciplines. Um, so I think that's that's one of the key things is that is that they haven't got the that necessary ability to reflect to these broader theories. I think the the second issue too goes back to what the IMS primary role is, which is balance of payments and global stability. And so often my sense is first and foremost, the key is to repay the debt, to repay external debt, to ensure global stability, global economic stability. Um and then, okay, secondary to that, economic growth and then social expenditure, but repay the debt first and foremost. Um, and so I think that's why you end up with the situation where you keep seeing fiscal austerity repeating because it's, hey, repay the debt and, hey, we only have this limited kind of population of ideas, which is what we've been trained in and what we're socialised in within this institution. So I think that's often why there's not this learning um, there was another interesting question. Sorry, I didn't get your name, um, Karen. Um, and, and this was around the external debt service. And and I think you hit the nail on the head, right? Um, is there's a number of things going on and why we've seen this rapid increase in debt service. And, and one is new COVID debt. So um, countries that, that could um, borrowed more to, to cover their COVID responses. Um, and the other issue was the the increase in U.S. interest rates, which meant that loans dom denominated in U.S. dollar ended up having vastly increased repayments at the flick of a switch. Um, and um, what's interesting too, and, and, you, and obviously the issue here is, okay, so we've got this new debt that needs repaid, so let's go to the IMF and get yet more loans <laughs> to repay that debt. Now, kind of mercifully, Many of the IMF loans, they're concessional, so it's not going to be at those very high interest rates um, that some of the countries, I know Kenya, for example, has a lot of private debt, which is very, very high interest rates versus what they would get in an IMF loan, which is a slightly lower interest rate. So, okay, there's that. But but it does speak to a broader issue around um, the global rules around debt. Um, you know, how much should countries repay of their debt? Um and, you know, what, what kind of grant element should there be? Because we won't run the risk, and I think this is what you're talking about, where where countries are simply getting kind of, they get a credit card to pay off a credit card, right? And so they're kind of trapped in this debt cycle. And, um, you know, this is where I think the IMF is to some degree aware of it and has, had so, has introduced um, 
um, some mechanisms to try and get a more elaborate debt restructuring, I think the common framework, to get private um, creditors together to kind of write off a bit of the debt. Uh, it's not getting that much traction. And so, you know, it, it's difficult to see at the moment how countries can actually avoid that debt cycle. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. Alex, if, I don't know if there's additional you want to add. Yeah, sure. Thanks for this. Um, well, a, a couple of comments kind of uh, picking uh, the thread together. So um, before before uh, you came uh, with Naomi, we were discussing uh, the Marxist heritage of uh, SOAS. So I'm like, OK, I'll, I'll quote Marx and then I'll walk it back a little bit and, and see where it takes us. So, you know, you ask, does the IMF not learn anything? You mentioned Hajun uh, Chang's work, who's now here, uh, uh, on, you know, the do as we say, but not as we do. Uh, and, you know, this links to Naomi's point. Well, has this work been picked up? Uh, I'll, I'll talk about this separately, but, you know, in a way, we wrote uh, a book that... Um, tries to be very uh, empirical mm -hmm. in a way, hopefully not dry, but very close to the econometric analysis, partly explicitly in order to build into these policy debates. What the book doesn't do at all, uh, which you know we've done in other in other contexts, but it doesn't get to the political economy questions there. You know, why do we see uh, the policies that we see? And, uh, you know, thinking about the state, you know, the classic Marxist understanding as well, what is the state but the executive committee of the bourgeoisie? And if we look at international financial institutions and we see how they are run, you know, who runs them? Who has the most voting shares? Who uh, is behind, uh, behind major decisions? It's countries in the global north. The U.S. notoriously has a veto point, a veto power that it carefully guards in uh, all the um, uh, major international financial institutions. And, uh, you know, there is uh, the current situation where uh, Belgium has more votes in the IMF than Indonesia does. Now, I have nothing against the Belgians, uh, but, you know, I, I'd say Indonesia is uh, kind of a major populous uh, economy that is kind of severely underrepresented in the decision-making structures of this institution. Now, you know, wh where does this uh, take us? You know, should we uh, abolish it or not? Uh, that's that's where, you know, I roll it back because uh, uh, very much, um, uh, I very much uh, believe in this Keynesian idea that you need an institution like this to recycle global uh, liquidity. So, uh, and instead, what we're trying to do in this book is to argue against what we term as the tyranny of shallow counterfactuals. So it's this idea, well, you know, you find all of these bad things about the IMF. Why don't countries not go to the IMF? Mm -hmm. uh, Right. If they default, that, that, like that's the number one response from IMF staff. Well, if a country defaults, it will be much, much tougher. And that is true. Uh, but then that uh, presumes that the only options is, well, you know, one super market oriented, austerity driven IMF program versus default. And, and what we're saying, well, is that there is space in between, right? Uh, there are different types of policy programs uh, that uh, can be uh, designed, uh, which require a degree of policy imagination, which the type of epistemic closure that, uh, that your remarks suggested to uh, do not allow, right? Uh, a very... Uh, tight knowledge regulation within these institutions was a hallmark of their practices. And, you know, um, this point, again, to return to Chang's point, that do as we say, but not as we do. Uh, you know, in today's world, uh, you have the global north doing massive industrial policy on a scale not done in decades. And you have the most economically successful country in the global south, China, 
managing to be so successful by completely rejecting all of the policies that uh, the IMF uh, promotes. So, so you know, there, there is this kind of weird uh, twilight zone where, uh, on the one hand, uh, there is this attempt to cling to past or orthodoxies. Uh, at the same time, there are really fundamental challenges uh, from the outside because, you know, the world is no longer a world where um, anyone believes that uh, market solutions are uh, the only solutions available. They are part of solutions, and sure, like um, carbon pricing is important, but when it comes to climate, but uh, it's not the be all and end all, and that's kind of the limits of their uh, policy imagination, which is slowly changing. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. I think that's really interesting. I think I want to, I want to see the next book on the political economy issues actually happening. yeah oh great okay good we'll hear about that have, been, have you got any questions online for us and we also have one a couple here as well so um do you want how do you want to do this oh there's we've got loads now okay do you do you want to come up here and use the mic here and do it yeah and uh would you like to go first why don't you go first while we're getting up and up here sure. um Hi, thanks for the great presentation. I'm, I'm Sharan, I'm a master's student in economic policy here, um, actually uh, from Sri Lanka. So a lot of ah. stuff that you've been saying uh, yeah, is quite true. Um, particularly interested in the, the sort of uh, rebranding of the IMF because I was very clear in the last few years, um, especially in civil society circles in Sri Lanka where people on the sort of left or critical side were really caught on the back foot because it was the IMF people that was advancing things like gender, social protection, at least they were paying lip service uh, to this stuff. So that was very interesting. Um, my question is actually more on, so as I understand it, a lot of these um, situations of debt crisis and, and um, um, which lead to going to the IMF are also uh, problems with the trade balance, with the, with the current account balance, right? And when I go through documents of the IMF regarding Sri Lanka, for example, there is almost no mention of exports. There's no mention of trade in general, except uh, some sort of um, eventual expectation that there would be uh, import liberalization, right? So the, the, the fact that there's an external problem that and uh, that leads to the crisis is almost never mentioned. And instead, the whole thing is framed as a budget problem, which is what leads to this whole austerity thing. So there's a conflation between, I think there's a there's a theoretical debate in economics about this, but like in my view, there's a conflation between two separate problems. So I was wondering in your research, um, is this something you noticed? I mean, how often does the IMF actually acknowledge issues of trade and trade imbalances and how they lead to these crises? And also, I mean, is there something to be said to the extent to which austerity actually makes these things worse? Because when you privatize your basic industries, when you have import liberalization, you lower your productivity and you just you're just waiting for the next um, you no know, ex external crisis. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, should we get some from the uh, online people? Yes. So we have Thien Go. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Could you please uh, tell us more about social spending floor as con conditionalities? Do you did you conduct interviews with IMF staff about conditionalities, how they are negotiated and enforced, and what is the theory underpinning the impositions of these conditions of these conditionalities? I participated in the social spending floor negotiations for Niger and didn't continue the. Uh, this sentence, I could see how con conditionalities led to SSF be set on ex an extern an extremely low levels of the government can meet these thresholds and obtain low disimbursement. It seems logical that imposing conditionalities on social spending would lead to such adverse incentives. Mm -hmm. So this is the go. We have a second question from uh, someone, um, anonymous attendee. Thanks for the excellent talk and book. Currently, digital transformation is well underway, particularly as it's led uh, and financed by um, global institutions, HICs, IFIS, and philanthropies um, in many low-income countries. 
debt is about control and thus power. With respect to conditionalities, are AI and digital technologies changing, exacerbating, alleviating the dynamics outlined in your talk? If so, not, why? That's more questions. Sounds like an unanswerable one. <laughs> Is that enough to, to for this round sure. and then we come back to it? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, sorry, that third question. Yeah, yeah, the third. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think uh, I'll start with a, a Shiran. Um, and I think, um, you know, you raise an interesting issue is that there's this current account imbalance, which is why the IMF is there, right? That's where they're, they're allowed to come and basically they mandate there's a current account imbalance. So what do we do? And you mentioned that, you know, They've got to have fiscal consolidation, and yet the problems seem to be external, uh, perhaps a trade issue. But really, the more obvious external problem of the last few years has been there was a pandemic and countries had to spend. And it wasn't that they were, uh, you know, sometimes the IMF can claim, well, countries, they were profligate and they were corrupt and so on, and that's what happened. But, I mean, COVID spending came and it was... It like tourism revenue, supply chains were were halted, and this seems completely, you know, not the fault of of the of the countries, right? Um, and you know, th this is problematic, and I think this is, you know, this is one of the concerns is is uh, the IMF does go straight to fiscal consolidation to 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 ensure that that debt is repaid when. In an ideal world and in a world with greater policy imagination and perhaps with a, with a greater view of history, um, there would be an allowance for uh, more industrial policy, not just green industrial policy, but industrial policy full stop, infant industry promotion, so that uh, countries can um, develop their industries, so that they can export on more value-added goods, not just primary materials, so that they in effect, obtain more resources, more foreign exchange, which they can use to repay debt. The problem is, I think, why this doesn't happen, is I think the IMF is very short-term in its thinking, right? So it, it, you know, if you see their projections, this kind of thing, it's it's three to three to five years at most horizons. Uh, that may sl be slightly changing with the resilience and sustainability facility, but in the case like Sri Lanka, it's a three to five year horizon, right? And so how do you fix something quickly in three to five years? Well, you just cut government spending and use that money to repay the debt. If you took the long, the much longer view, well, the view might be invest in industrial policy, invest in these infant industries. And in 10, 15, 20 years time, that's where your forex is coming from, right? But it's that longer time horizon, which their, uh, their analytics don't quite allow for yet. So I think that's a big issue is the time horizon they're looking at. Um, there was, uh, yeah, there was our AI and digital technologies changing the dynamics. Um, I don't have an answer for that. It's a very good question. Um, what I can say is, is I know that during COVID, uh, they did make a lot greater use of kind of virtual capacity development this isn't quite going into ai and it's very primitive digital technology i also know that in their capacity development activities they are looking at digital technologies and how they can be used uh to to monitor the macro economy of countries but beyond that uh i don't know what's happening and i think also uh, beyond a year or two it's very unclear because developments in ai are uh, uh, happening so quickly. I saw Chat GPT 4.0 released a few days ago, and and it's kind of quite shocking how how rapidly um, more advanced it's become in a very short period. Um, I think I've missed someone's question. I didn't quite catch oh, it. This is a, yes, this is. Oh, I can, you know, I can, I can leave that to you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, on digital transformations. I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm also not uh, not really sure what the IMF is doing on that. I mean, the World Bank is doing stuff, but uh, the IMF, I think it's uh, it's slightly further away from uh, its mandate, or at least I'm I'm unaware of any major developments on, on that end. Now, the question on S uh, social spending floors, um, you know, incentives to set them at very low levels in order for them to unlock payments. Yes, countries have such incentives 
But the moment you design a policy that, um, you know, if anything, the IMF is full of PhD level economists who should understand how incentives work. Now, I'm definitely not somebody who would ever call for stringent conditionalities or more conditionalities. But if the IMF is going to have a meaningful uh, role in dealing with social spending issues, uh, then it should have, it should be driven by kind of underlying uh, considerations that are uh, at the forefront of where the uh, academic thinking on these things is, right? So if you say, well, I'm just going to add a bunch of policy areas that are going to change from country to country, and I'm going to call this social spending, and I'm going to allow the country to decide what goes in or out of it. You know, of course, many countries will choose to have very little in it so that they know they're going to meet it. They're not going to get, uh, you know, admonished by the IMF because they don't meet their social spending targets and so on. But then that de facto becomes an irrelevant metric, right? So so if they are to do it, well, unless the, the more sinister explanation is that this is a PR game that, uh, that helps sustain a, a rhetoric of... Um, change practices, which I, I'm not that cynical. So so I think there are uh, well-meaning efforts to incorporate uh, these considerations, um, but they're not kind of where, uh, say, the social policy community is when it comes to thinking around these issues. Yeah, I, that's very generous of you, I think. Um, <laughs> next two more questions over here, I think, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Hi, Harry. Uh, I was just wondering, you mentioned that um, debt generated in do uh, US dollars has become more expensive due to rate increases. Um, I was wondering if you see following countries' experiences of COVID, uh, of COVID and the big increases in uh, government spending and government debt, uh, if, there would, if you think that there's going to be a shift away from uh, the dollar when it comes to global lending, is there as long as I, I'm not too sure on that. So, um, I've sort of seen that there's been uh, beginnings of the trend towards dollar, e dollarization of the rest of the globe. That's a good question. I, I have no idea what that would even mean for the IMF, right? Mm -hmm. It's the global currency. And I think, Jonathan, at the back, I think you had a question. Did you? Have you still got a question? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Uh, um, thank you. Really, really interesting presentation. I, I'm I'm not an economist, but um, we organised an event. Sean, Kate went to. I think you came, didn't you? The, on the strike of debt crisis this week. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, I kind of expected the the discussion to be on the kinds of things you've been talking about, and the kind of being very angle. So it's very critical of the IMF. The focus is actually on 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 strike and political elites. Yeah. And I, I just wonder this story about you're telling about the resilience of, of these policies, in spite of the evidence that they don't work. Part of the story behind it is that, that there's a demand in, in particular sectors of, you know, the, these countries. And and there's you know there was one kind of perverse um, kind of example given uh, about the um, how the, the current government is is responding to the kind of the, the the package, the you know, the package, and it's the um, the speaker was saying perversely they were pushing hard on the things that weren't popular. So you know, electricity prices going through the roofs, getting rid of the subsidies and so on, but not pushing on the things that would be very popular in striking society, like addressing corruption and um, you know, institutional reforms. So I, I just wonder if you could say something about that that dimension around you know domestic political elites and what they gain from these kinds of policies. Great question, yeah. Uh, if there's one more, we'll take that. Oh, there is one more. Okay. Oh, no, there's one here. Let's have, I think you, that's, yeah. Is that all right? Thank you. Great, thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Michelle Richter. Um, thank you for your presentation. You mentioned um, about how the return of like, structural adjustment is also visible in like 
the World Bank and their development policy financing. So I was wondering if you could say something more about that and how it shows up there and to what extent that aligns with the conditionalities that IMF has um, and might also be, I mean, that might be outside the scope of what you looked at, but also whether that aligns with any of the other IFIs or um, development banks and the conditionalities that they would have. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, I'll try my very best. Um, so I'm going to start with Harry around the shift away from the dollar and global lending. And my answer there is, uh, I don't really have an answer at this stage. I'm not sure what it's going to mean for the future. I, that's an unfulfilling answer for you, but um, it's something I'd need to look into more. Um, but it is a good question, I think. Um, Jonathan, uh, this is a question I think that there are a number of IMF scholars have actually looked into. I think it was, um, was it James Vreeland's scapegoat theory? So there have been various theories around, you know, certain officials want particular conditions or want programs or they want the IMF to come in to use as a scapegoat for policies they actually wanted to enact anyway, but but that were unpopular, um, these kinds of things. And I also think that uh, it is not necessarily inconsistent that the IMF comes in with fiscal austerity and that some of the elites benefit from that. Indeed, we saw that in the book with the income inequality deciles where, you know, in some countries the capital account opened, which actually gave an avenue for the rich to take their money out of the country, right? So I don't think there's an inconsistency there. And I think um, part of it speaks to, you know, the IMF com coming in with a sense of what is the political economy there and ensuring the people themselves are um, not unfairly targeted by their policies. Um and um, I also think part of that is um, who the IMF deals with in these countries. Often it's the Ministry of Finance and sometimes solely the Ministry of Finance. And I think um, part of what would ensure the IMF is kind of more embracing the views of of, of the people and, 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 and not the elites is to perhaps bring in other ministries into discussion as well. Um, I don't, sorry, I missed the additional question, but um, Alex, did you want to add to some of these? Sure, points? yeah, sure. Maybe a couple of points. You know, the de-dollarization question, I think that's a really important question. Um, my take is that I don't see it happening on a massive scale anytime soon. Um, if it, you know, if we look at, well, you know, the SDR, is, a, is which is the IMF's quasi-currency, its unit of account, so to speak, is a, uh, is a composite, uh, it's a weighted currency that includes um, RMB and euros and so on. Uh, so maybe the weight of other currencies would change in how the SDRs are denominated. Um, but uh, I don't really see a shift away from the dollar, if anything, the dollar becomes, uh, in moments of crisis, becomes a safe haven, right? Like everyone immediately shifts their money to dollars because that's seen as more, um, as, as a safer, safer investment. Of course, China is trying to change uh, the use of its currency around the world, including uh, kind of giving incentives to countries to uh trade with it in um in Roman B terms but I think that's a very long term process and very uncertain in in many ways and you know and in a way uh inextricably linked to policy developments like you know if Trump gets elected and put some kind of Fed chair who has Different ideas than the current one, you know, we, we don't know how that will play out. So, uh, of course, there are these uh, discussions in Latin America in particular around de-dollarization, but I think they're, they're quite um, uh, discussions that are at the beginning. Uh, you know, uh, on the relationship between the IMF and the World Bank and its policy conditionalities, um, they're actually more and more linked and uh, they, in a way, feed off each other. 
Um, I gather you you work on the or follow the World Bank and um, say you might have followed um, what do we call the CCDRs, uh, Climate Change and Development Reports, or I think that's the acronym. Uh, and basically, the IMF draws on uh, recommendations in the bank's uh, reports to inform its own conditionality, and then the bank draws on the IMF's fiscal projections and so on in order to uh, to devise its programs. So, so it's um, uh, it's a very close exchange. Uh, and in a way, they're both um, very much on the same page as to the direction of travel, especially when it comes to climate issues, which is catalyzing private climate financing. Right. And and developing the appropriate policy environments in order to do that. This is what um, Daniela Gabor, who's an economist uh, in Bristol, uh, calls as the Wall Street consensus. So this uh, de-risking agenda um, being an agenda that promotes uh, kind of the socialization of risk and the privatization of profit uh, when it comes to climate, green transition issues. So in that sense, they're very much um, on the same page. And, you know, on the political elites, I'm totally with you, you know. Um, the Are there political elites that push on, push for policies that are, have adverse redistributional uh, effects? Uh, absolutely. Um, but that is where supposedly uh, technocratic international institutions uh, should uh, kind of ring alarm bells about what this is going to do for the Sri Lankan economy, uh, or, you know, any economy for that matter, um, in the medium to long run, right? And, um, and we don't really see that, even though they have the mandate to do that um, in, in terms of their policy advice and so on. And, and uh, you know, we have seen versions of this around the world. And at the end of the day, to go back to, to the question earlier, like if a government can um, can get its current account balance uh, uh, in order, then essentially that's a tick from for the IMF's box and uh, unlocks. Uh, you know, is considered a successful program, even though uh, the policies introduced are fundamentally flawed in a way that they set the foundations for further crisis uh, down the line. Oh, okay. So, you have two more on that oh, as well. Oh, my goodness. That's ah, okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. Shall we? Yeah, keep going. Unless you, unless you want to take us to the bar. No, they can't come to the bar. So let's go <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, so um, I was just like wondering, coming back to the uh, domestic scene, um, so and this subtitle, so Social Protection in the Age of Austerity, and given the... Um, international constraints imposed on developing countries especially. So how could they actually achieve or formulate structure policy coordination? So coordination between fiscal policy, social security spending within the international constraints, say uh, capital flows or FDI or trade issues. Like, well, you are like very like in dire need of uh, hard currency earnings, but you also need to, I mean, keep going, I could say, in terms of protect socially the population and also manage your fiscal coffers. So how could you, for example, so given this international constraints, so um, I just have wondered your ideas in terms of policy coordination. Mm -hmm. Um, hi, uh, my name is Anna Dugan. Thank you very much for your presentation. That was fantastic. Um, my question was just on um, adaptive social protection, um, specifically. In disastrous financing, we see a lot of UN agencies recently pushing for social protection that is cash-based and goes around governments. And I was wondering if this 
re the reason for this was kind of in the wake of neoliberal policies, structural adjustment programs, and minimizing social protection spending from government lens. So now UN agencies are trying to compensate for that by pushing for cash-based social protection that goes around governments. Mm -hmm. So when you say goes around, do you mean bypassing governments? Yeah, in which like World Bank disbursements would go directly to um, communities rather than going through the structures that governments have created for social protection. Interesting. And do we have something from online? Yeah, to uh, online, we have Ingrid asking, I would be very interested to hear more about your data collection, from which documents uh, you could extract the conditionality imposed. Sometimes it feels to me a lot of the impositions are done informally. And then we have a second question from uh, Aderonke Ige. My name is Ader Aderonke, Development Studies Department SOAS. Fantastic presentation. I look forward to reading the work fully. Very interesting expose. My question is whether, in view of the backdrop of deep-rooted harm done in the name of policy packages and recommendation, which is more of I'm um, twisting rather than mere suggestions, is there a chance of late developers actually achieving economic growth or actually development considering the impossible web of the unhelpful alternatives such as that are being paraded by new donor countries, aid mongers who shall remain unnamed? <laughs> these, alternatives, <laughs> these alternatives look quite appalling. Uh, with next to no conditionalities, but with dire long-term or long-run consequences. The arrangements would appear as South-South corporations, in fact, but beyond the surface, it appears like a new form of colonialism. Mm. Should I ask a question? Okay, we're going to wrap up with these, so okay. final words as well. Uh, okay, thanks. Really, really fantastic questions. Um, you know, uh, I'll take the first two and then Tom will respond to the other two. Um, policy coordination. Um, there are attempts at policy coordination in the Global South. You know, the G77 is very active in trying to push for policy coordination, um, maybe slower than one would expect, partly because these governments... Uh, you know, uh, don't have fully overlapping policy preferences. But you can see it on the margins, right? You can see, say, okay, we were in Washington a couple of weeks ago where the spring meetings of the IMF are, you know, all of the discussions there were around taxing wealth, right? So uh, as a next frontier, you know, interestingly, it's an agenda that's heavily promoted by the Brazilian presidency of the G20. Uh, Global South countries are the forefront of pushing it. Uh, you know, the panel promoting it had uh, Gabriel Zuckman, Joe Stiglitz and Esther Duflo. So, you know, two French uh, people and an American. Um, but, you know, th this is really like the idea being that, okay, we as the world got this minimum uh, corporation tax and now we need to get a minimum wealth tax. And once it's in place and, you know, bit by bit, it will climb. So there are these efforts at policy coordination and the, the G20 is very important uh, in that regard, in the sense that when it is chaired by uh, countries in the global south, there are attempts to to put items on the agenda that otherwise are not there. But the institutional constraints are, you know, are big, right? There is no um, there is no way to escape, and especially for the smaller countries in the world, right? Like, uh, obviously, if you're, uh, you know, Turkey or Indonesia or Mexico, you obviously have different uh, uh, degrees of uh, policy space than uh, than you otherwise do. And this point um, about policy space brings me to Anna, right? Anna's point uh, on adaptive social protection, cash transfers, and so on. And I think the policy space, policy space, okay, to rephrase it, this brings me to the point around state capacity, 
right? What the policies that we've been discussing uh, over the past hour and a half uh, have been doing is they are systematically dismantling state infrastructures. They are starving governments uh, for much needed uh, investments, public investments that can pay uh, dividends in the medium to long term. So basically, you end up with emaciated civil services, uh, public services, sorry, uh, public administrations, uh, fundamentally understaffed uh, ministries, especially ministries in the uh, <clears throat> in the um, uh, social spending area, uh, in social areas, uh, you know. Um, Sociologist Pierre Bourdieu has this argument around uh, the right of arm of the state and the left arm of the state. The right arm of the state being uh, the security apparatus, uh, justice, you know, the um, fiscal ministries and so on. So the ones that um, maintain uh, order in the hard sense, whereas the left arm is the one that's kind of the redistributive one and so on. So, you know, very often in academia, we like the blanket way of discussing neoliberalism or these market oriented policies is that they lead to um, uh, uh, what's the word um, kind of taking apart the state. They actually lead uh, to taking apart parts of the state. Right, whereas strengthening others, and there is this transfer of um, capacities from one part to another. So, you know, if you have starved, starved governments of uh, public investment for a long enough time, then, then you know, of course, you can say, well, we'll experiment with digital transformation, and give everyone, you know, this card that has I don't know hundred dollars on it, and and you know, they can go out as good consumers and exercise their uh, rights as consumers, and you know, buy whatever uh, with those hundred dollars. That's obviously easier to do than saying, well, you know, we're going to build universal social health coverage programs where um, pregnant women have adequate access to health care, children have adequate access to all medical services necessary, where uh, kind of workers have access to uh, insurance uh, mechanisms for accidents and so on and so forth. Uh, so in a way, these approaches, again, lack this structural imagination, right? Take a system as given and you're like, well, with this system, maybe just giving everyone a card with a hundred bucks on it is, is the simpler way to do it. Uh, but that does not add up to a transformative, uh, social policy, uh, in, in ways that, you know, in the traditional way we think about social policy and the mean, the ends of social policy uh, as, um, you know, to think about uh, kind of traditional welfare state research or social policy research is like helping people maintain livelihoods independent of their position in the marketplace, which is uh, a quote for, I mean, the way Josta Esping Anderson uh, discusses it. So, you know, th that should be the ideal endpoint of social policy, but that's sadly not where we're at. I'll pass over to you. Okay. Um, uh, I'll just address um, Ingrid, I think, who's online, had a question around data collection and what about these informal um, request demands that the IMF has? And, um, <laughs> On data collection, so uh, to obtain these conditions, these documents, these formal IMF documents, they're quite, they're very structured, um, in the sense that it will start with an IMF staff report, overview of what's happening in the economy, a series of statistics, and then uh, towards the end of the report, they're usually about a hundred pages, roughly each. Um, and so for each program, there's an approval document, and then every three to six months, there's a review, depending on uh, the program, it could be six to eight reviews, um, each of around 100 pages. And for these documents, uh, toward the end, for about 30 pages, they have a memorandum of economic and financial policies, which effectively acts as a, as a contract. And within that, there is, they specifically state these are the conditions, right? And there will be some conditions that are, they have different uh, types of conditions. Importantly, though, 
some conditions have to be met uh, in order for the program to continue. So if they are not met, then there's an official process that the IMF has to go through, um, that the staff have to go through where they seek a, a waiver from the IMF executive board. And so while there are perhaps informal agreements that occur behind the scenes, um, we, you know, it's these policies that uh, ensure access to credit, or rather if they aren't followed, then access to the credit can be denied, which to us are the most important because they have this this carrot or, or uh, this carrot attached um, to it. Um, and so in short, our data collection processes, obtaining all these conditions, as, in, as I say, there are various types, various flavors. Um, um, Can I add something? Yeah, go for it. So, and if anything, we're undercounting conditionality. Mm. So we're being kind of conservative in our, in our approach. Um, uh, which which goes back to you know trying to do this uh, in as uh, rigorous a way as possible uh, to kind of make sure that if anything we are being super conservative in our measurement strategy. Austere, uh, austere yeah. exactly. Um, yeah, so I'll go to now to um, a final question, which is a very big question around. I think uh, it was also online. Can late developers develop, given <laughs> given the circumstances? Um, yes, uh, I believe they can, but it's very hard, uh, obviously. Um, but I think I'm optimistic. I mean, this is pure speculation, right? Like I, I don't kind of have the crystal ball into the future. But I do think there's a couple of things that give me some optimism, and and this is the cynic in me, and that is the lack of development in some countries is, we know, going to impact the already advanced countries. Uh, we've seen already problems around a global pandemic, right? So, you know, what if a new virus emerges in a country that's not sufficiently developed to monitor it and so on? I mean, this is going to increasingly happen, right? Um, especially with deforestation. So there's exposure, human and animal exposures, more exposure to these kinds of diseases. Then the lack of development in these countries is a problem of kind of fortress first world. And I call it fortress first world because another problem, problem, is uh, especially in Europe is, is immigration as well. So these are problems that are seen as there is a lack of development in some countries. And so what we see is this lack of development is very much becoming a problem of the rich countries. The final thing, and and this is where my hope also is, is climate change as well. Um, it's, it is the case that less developed countries are going to be impacted by climate. And here it's a mitigation situation. You think of a country like of Kenya, for example, but also increasingly, uh, less developed countries are wanting to tap into their own resources, Senegal, Uganda, and this is not consistent with the, the green global future that, that the global north wants. However, these countries are saying, well, mate, if you want us not to get that stuff on the ground, we need a bit of, bit of grant money, right? to compensate for it. And for the global north, you know, it, maybe not now, but 20, 30 years time, this is now our problem because the world's going to be on fire, right? And so <laughs> the optimism is that, you know, when humanity is at stake, finally, uh, yes, let's, let's help uh, the global south. Um, but also I think the IMF, uh, RSF, this is new money. It is looking promising, you know, with some caveats that, that Alex mentioned. I do think there is genuine movement in the IMF, not just towards, you know, greening its lending, but also towards ensuring there's more social protection. The, the very fact that in an IMF spring meeting, there is even whispers of wealth tax. This is this is quite profound, right? So I think there is optimism. Um, yeah, I don't know if you have any final words on that. Um... You know, I think there was this point around so-called South-South uh, cooperation, right, and the role of China, um, who, which was not named, but I think was uh, <laughs> implicit. Uh, I think the entry of China into the development financing world is, is a good thing. The the, um, the money necessary 
for uh, the green transition for development objective uh, for development policies uh, is uh, in the range of trillions and uh, you know we're still very often talking to the tune of billions and in some instances to the tune of millions uh, so uh, you know you see you know in climate you know the sometimes countries negotiating over 100 million here or there uh when uh, which is really a drop in in the ocean um so so i think that uh china entering the development financing field uh, is a good thing uh i don't buy this um Kind of criticism in the global north around what is known as debt trap diplomacy uh, or at least i haven't seen many evidence of that uh, china has been um, willing to renegotiate on a bilateral basis a lot of uh, the debt obligations to it in recent years it has been much more hesitant uh, to enter into kind of collective renegotiations uh, for reasons that I, in many cases I don't think are wholly unreasonable. Um, but uh, but that uh, that remains to be seen. My take is the more money that is available uh, to support uh, low and middle income countries development efforts, uh, the better and uh, the more promising because the needs, especially around climate change adaptation and mitigation, uh, are enormous and we're very, very far from them and not leave it at that. A nice positive optimistic note. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That was a really, really tremendous presentation. And um, if we have time, we're going to head to the bar for um, a drink. If anyone would like to join us in the bar club, then you can ask more questions, more difficult questions. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just would like a question. Thank you. Carlos. Oh, Carlos, Carlos. question now. Carlos is my head of department, so you probably would have to take that. <laughs> Carlos, uh, yeah, go on. He's still online. Uh, so I wonder if you can share your view on the extent to which the management of conditionality and austerity has been shaped by a systematic ideological conversion of African technocrat technocrats in ministries of finance to the conventional consensus covering the core IMF principles, which render the imposition of conditions unnecessary. So these like-minded technocrats are now able to discipline their ministers and presidents to abide by the rules. Mm -hmm. Do you want to take it or shall I? Uh, I'll take it partially. Um, okay, and then start. The, I, I mean, this only half. I think this goes to a pack that was a point that was raised. Sorry, I think the name was, was Shiran, which is, you know, Sometimes, yeah, sometimes, not in all cases, but sometimes uh, it doesn't matter what, you know, the, the for example, an African Ministry of Finance that they've been socialised into a particular way of thinking and uh, there's just an external shock and, you know, they just, they will still need conditions or, or you know, the IMF, when they come to the IMF, they are given conditions and they they may regardless decide we were going to do that anyway, but nonetheless, there will be conditions because the IMF will want to ensure that the external debt is repaid. And so, you know, in that case, it's not that the, the African government, for example, was privileged. It was just that there was an external shock and that they, in the case of COVID, had to spend to deal with it. Um, that was my initial take on it but i'll leave it to alex no uh, i think i think this is an excellent question and it goes to the power of the imf you know i'd say when we talk about the imf or international financial institutions kind of conditionalities the stuff we've been discussing thus far is the tip of the iceberg and the power they wield and very often it's um it's uh the power that we don't see that is just uh, just as important, right? Uh, you know, I mean, uh, most of us uh, are social scientists in this room, so there's this classic uh, kind of formulation topology of power by Stephen Luke's, uh, kind of the direct power over decisions, but then also power over non-decisions and ideological power. And, you know, in a way, conditionality is power over decisions. And there are all of these 
other ways in which power is exercised that um, uh, are much more um, kind of uh, hidden from uh, from sight. The you know there's a some work looking at uh, training. Uh, well, technical assistance, capacity development, basically the training centers of the IMF uh, and how they are explicitly uh, geared towards uh, generating policy convergence, right? So, so uh, you the IMF pays for upper, upper middle ranking civil servants to go usually to Vienna, but some other uh, cities as well and get trained on how to manage the economy and they have to do problem sets right like a concrete problem set um this is from a colleague's work uh who studied this uh, a few years ago was okay you have a case study on the ukraine and how to balance the ukrainian budget right uh that already carries within it the assumption that a, bud a budget should always be balanced um so so the the space of the policy imagination in a way uh narrows down and that's part of the um, uh, agenda uh of the imf I, if i if i you know may be allowed a, a personal anecdote which you know given that it's um development studies department i did my master's in a development studies department and you know i remember um uh, in my first class, you know, having some colleagues who uh, were very disappointed that uh, when when the head of the program, uh, Ha Jun Chang, said that, uh, well, you know, we're not we're going to expose you to different models of development. And they were like, well, we thought there was one way to do this and that when I went back to my country, I could implement this and, and generate development. And of course, what the IMF as well as the World Bank uh, do offer are these uh, simple narratives for how to run uh, economic policy that, you know, as uh, as the gentleman in the beginning of uh, the Q&A said, you know, uh, have uh, not really uh, yielded the expected results. So in the literature, there is a lot of discussion of the so-called sympathetic interlocutors who are very, very much uh, nurtured by the IMF uh, over the years. And um, and in many instances, this goes back to another question that was raised uh, around the structural issues involved. Uh, you know, even let's say even in Colombia, right? You had a left-wing government uh, coming into power, and they chose as finance minister uh, Jose Antonio Campo, who's a left-wing uh, academic, no doubt but far from kind of the more lefty firebrand uh, ministers in the government. And Jose Antonio was seen as kind of the um, uh, an acceptable face to global finance uh, to uh, to engage with. So, so, you know, we do see these structural constraints time, time and time uh, again, um, where governments, even left-wing governments, uh, and I'm not talking about Ocampo now, but even left-wing governments choose more uh, moderate, uh, market-friendly finance ministers because that will appease the impersonal financial markets, which can, of course, uh, uh, inflict real time uh, real uh, pain uh, on governments in real time through the borrowing costs so so definitely we see that um but that just goes to the entrenched power and epistemic privilege that the IMF and the World Bank uh, hold uh, in the global economy Great. Well, that really was the final answer. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.